Welcome to Planning, Management, and Leadership for Health IT, Managing Change. This is Lecture A, Approaches to Change Management. The objectives for this unit, Managing Change, are to define change management, discuss the reasons why change management is important to the success of healthcare IT system implementations, Describe the effects of introducing or changing information technology in a group or organization. And identify elements critical to successful management of change. The quote from Woodrow Wilson on the slide shows some of the consequences of leading changes in organizations. Why do people react so negatively to change? Partly because change is not easy. Even when everyone in the physician practice agrees that replacing a practice management system is necessary, when it actually gets implemented, it will require many changes. Not only will the work of nearly everyone in the practice need to change, but there may be changes in how individuals communicate with many partners outside the practice, like the lab or the many pharmacies the practice deals with on a daily basis. Change means disruption. It's crucially important that changes to systems and processes be addressed in the planning process. During this time, a team can look at every process that will change, from workflow to payment to treatment of patients, and define a process for managing the change instead of addressing it as it occurs. This approach is termed change management, and without it, many implementations have been unsuccessful. In this unit, we will discuss strategies for managing the changes involved in implementing information systems in health settings. People's reaction to change has been one of frustration for centuries, as evidenced by Machiavelli, as he so wisely stated in The Prince in 1513. There is nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. Because the innovator has for enemies all those who have done well under the old conditions, and lukewarm defenders in those who may do well under the new. Lorenzi and Riley list some of the definitions of change management shown on the slide. There are several elements common to these definitions. The definitions include words like methodology and systematic and planning, indicating that the organization needs to anticipate and actively work to smooth the transitions. Good change management techniques will help the organization and the people within it adapt to and respond well to the needed changes. McCarthy and Eastman discuss other concepts that could be confused with change management. They indicate that one meaning of the expression change management relates to technical issues, such as software version control. But that is not the kind of change management we are talking about here. They also contrast change management with project management. Change management involves people, or what they call the human side of IT implementation. A key element for a successful project is to engage those individuals who are going to be affected by the change. According to McCarthy and Eastman, project management is much more linear and task-focused, whereas change management deals with the complexities of human behavior. A good project management plan creates a structure and a foundation in which the change management process can occur. The two disciplines, though different, complement and support each other. McCarthy and Eastman also emphasize that the plan for either the project or the change management process is not the same thing as the end result of the planning effort. While the planning is important, things happen that require plans to be changed. So while the change management plan should be proactive, meaning that it should anticipate what is needed to prepare people for the change. It should also be flexible, so that the leader can react to needs that arise during the implementation. 
Creasy discusses three integrated parts for ensuring change is positive and successful. Each is somewhat dependent on the other. First is the recognition that change is going to happen. Remember that change is not positive to all people, but generally, when thinking about change, it is taking place to improve something in some fashion. For instance, as Creasy notes, it might be aimed at reducing operating costs, improving revenues of a physician practice or service line, solving logistical or workflow problems, or seizing opportunities within the organization. Another example might be a clinical decision support program which alerts physicians to drug interactions while they are prescribing. Such a program may be designed to reduce medication errors. Second, we have project management. Project management is centered on balancing out time, cost, and scope constraints to utilize resources effectively. Creasy calls the specific plans and actions needed for project management managing the technical side of the change. In our example of the clinical decision support system, the goal of project management might be to develop a plan for getting the necessary hardware and software installed, the drug interaction rules designed, the system tested to make sure it works properly, and the plan for where, in what sequence, and on what timeline it will go live. Finally, we have change management, which, as Creasy says, seeks to apply a systematic approach to helping the individuals impacted by the change. A good change management strategy will build support within the affected community and will address resistance issues, or what Creasy calls managing the people side of the change. Change management involves preparing the people who will have to use the new system. This means not just training them on how to technically use the system, but preparing them for how it will impact their workflow and addressing what the change means to them. For instance, in the example of implementing the drug interaction program, physicians need to understand that it may take them longer to order medications because they will have to react to alerts to possible interactions, which may lead to resistance. Or they may resist having the computer tell them that they have to change their planned orders. Anticipating these reactions and dealing with them and providing support before they threaten to derail the project is what change management is all about. It is often difficult to predict how individuals will react to changes in their accustomed roles. Clinicians may be asked to perform tasks that they've never done before. Also, there may be more handoffs in the care process that are no longer evident because information is being documented electronically and there is less interaction. For instance, a physician used to be able to see a patient, then simply ask her nurse to call the patient's pharmacy to fill a prescription. Now the physician has to interact with an information system, which is less personal. Likewise, a new system forces organizations to work in teams which may be new and off-putting at first. Organizations who haven't acted as teams before are now in the position of having to promote the interdependence of one role on the next one. Still, another team member may be threatened that an information system can now, in three mouse clicks, do what used to take her two hours to do. The team member performed the task the old way for years and had perfected the process over several years. Now a computer does it. What does that say about her value? It is important to get the perspectives of different individuals as to what the change means to them personally and how they think it will affect their work. In the examples we have discussed, you can see that the physician's tasks may change in one way but other team members' jobs may change in different ways. Finally, we must recognize that every system implementation should have a leader or champion. This person may not be obvious at first, but to be successful, a leader who owns and understands the change must be named or must emerge. When managed well, the change process can actually improve not just the goal that was intended, but the satisfaction of the individuals involved. 
as McCarthy and Eastman state, change management is about facilitating the human transition from the present to the future. Often when teams begin planning their change management strategy, they ask how can they manage the changes. Instead of asking how, teams may be wise to figure out exactly what the focus should be. Nichols suggests that the groups who must manage the change should begin by answering the questions you see on this slide. What are we trying to accomplish? What changes are necessary? That is, what about our processes, budget, human resource requirements, and other things must change in order to accomplish our goal? What will signal success? That is, what measures of performance are we trying to influence with the change? And how will we document the impact on these measures? These questions must be addressed by the people who are going to be affected by the change. Even more importantly, Nichols emphasizes focusing on the why issues with the questions on the slide. By getting those involved to really think about their current processes and identify why things are the way they are, it will bring home to them why there is a need for the change. You should also recognize that different members of the organization may answer these questions differently. For the IT staff, implementing an IT system is the focus of their job. For the clinicians, they may see the system as keeping them from doing their job, that is, caring for patients. So part of the job of the change manager is to bridge these two perspectives and show the clinicians how the technology can assist them in caring for patients. One approach to characterizing the phases of change that an organization will go through has been called the change approach because each of the six phases begins with one of the letters in the word change. We will describe these phases in the next few slides. You will see the similarity of this approach to some of the others we have discussed. The first phase is to create tension. It may seem odd to create tension, but for change to occur, there needs to be some tension, some discomfort with the way things currently are. Out of that tension can come a vision for the way they could be. In some cases, you may have to provide data to convince skeptics that there really is a need for change and that the vision is clear and that it can be accomplished. The second phase is harnessing support for the change initiative. Here, an organization should identify stakeholders and their motivations for change. The senior leaders in the organization should certainly support the change and a supporting communication plan should be developed. Each stakeholder's role should be clearly documented and they should remain engaged throughout the process. The third phase is to articulate goals. In other words, define what you want the desired outcome to be. The goals should be what has been called SMART goals. That is, they should be specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. Not only should you articulate your goals, but you should identify how you will measure their achievement. The fourth phase, nominating roles, involves selecting specific individuals for the team, assuring that team members have the right skill sets and assigning responsibility for the various tasks and outcomes. Growing capability is the fifth phase. This means that the necessary training for those responsible for the change is in place. The sixth phase occurs when we institutionalize or entrench changes. This means we are clearly stating this is the way we do things around here. The additional supportive processes that accompany the specific IT change should now be in place, and what was once the new way of doing things becomes just the normal way of doing things. McCarthy and Eastman have outlined several benefits of successful change management as shown on the slide. First and foremost, is that if the change is managed properly, 
the change process will proceed more smoothly and faster, and the outcomes will be better as well. Change management should have been attentive throughout the process to the people aspects, and this attention can pay off in greater employee satisfaction. As McCarthy and Eastman say, when people learn new skills, meet performance expectations, and contribute to a greater good, they feel pride in their accomplishments. In addition to whatever efficiencies the new system may provide, when employees are satisfied, they are going to perform better and provide better service. Finally, McCarthy and Eastman refer to the increased organizational nimbleness. By having gone through a successful change process, the organization is more confident and capable of responding to new initiatives or to adapting to new challenges. This picture provides a good illustration for what the different change management approaches have in common. Although informed consent usually refers to obtaining consent from patients for medical procedures, or sometimes research studies, the idea of getting informed buy-in for the organizational change that will occur when implementing new information systems is a good one. Just like this goat that is doing remarkably well adapting to what is undoubtedly for him a new way of moving, the principles outlined in this presentation can help individuals and organizations adapt to the changes that new technology will bring. This concludes Lecture A of Managing Change. In summary, change management is not just about technical change or organizational change. There is a human element that must be considered in order to successfully facilitate change. Change must be goal-driven, and those goals must be communicated clearly and repeatedly to keep everyone involved focused on the end result.